First of all, let us acknowledge and thank our musicians on the piano, Nancy Dibblewitz, on the organ, Mark Westerhausen, and our conductor, Connie Bowman. Secondly, let me say that I, Rushton Adamson, I'm blessed to be worshiping here today with you. Looking back on my past life, I'm grateful to be alive. God is indeed merciful, and God's grace is unlimited, even, it seems, to some, some undeserving sinners. Now back to the business on hand. There are quite a few meetings happening this week, namely trustees on Monday, preschool board on Tuesday, and church council on Thursday. If needed, the times and locations of these meetings are listed on the weekly calendar, posted at both entrances one and two, they can also be found online on the LEO UMC calendar site. As regards this Wednesday night dinner, and probably due to St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> the, the menu consists of pot potato soup accompanied by breadsticks. Also, perhaps because they are both green, broccoli salad and Watergate cake will be served, which you are sure to enjoy. Next Sunday, March 20, our Boy Scout Troop 49 will be serving a hearty breakfast from 8 a.m. until noon for free will donations. The menu will feature pancakes, sausage, biscuits and gravy, eggs and fruit. They hope you will come and enjoy their hospitality. We still seek volunteers to greet visitors and our church family before the, Sunday, the second services as they come to worship on Sunday morning. Please contact the church office if you would be willing to share your friendly smile. Finally, let me introduce Rhonda Smith, who will be giving the admissions moment. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. He's tall. <laughs> okay, today we're going to highlight two of our admissions that we do here at the First one is the uh, AMCOR, and that stands, stands for the United Methodist uh, Committee on Relief. <laughs> and we have a short video to watch. Because you were there. The hungry were fed. The displaced found shelter. We need to be very proud that we're a part of AMCOR. AMCOR is a United Methodist organization and it goes all over the world. And the really, really cool thing about AMCOR is when our church sends our tithe to the United Methodist, wherever they send it to, um, the 
young poor is a percentage of that. Our denomination takes a percentage of that, and it's UMCOR, and it's sent to UMCOR, um, just places that need relief. And the really cool thing about that is through our tithes, we already have people ready to go. And so when we send money to UMCOR, 100% of it goes to the relief that it is trying to help. So we don't have to go and gather people like, okay, we're gonna go help with that hurricane. They're already there. They're already paid through the church and they are ready to go. So that's just a really cool thing. So whenever you donate money to Encore, 100% of it goes to the mission. So thank you for um, donating money to that. And our Indiana conference, Jeff just got a thing from um, Bishop Trimble and we sent our, just our conference, the Indiana conference, sent $10,000 last year to Encore for um, Ukraine. So to help over there. So it's just, of course, a good thing. So if you're not sure when there's a um, disaster in the world, and you're not sure, you know, well, how can I help? Where do I send my money? Send it to Encore because they are on top of it. And when we went for um, Katrina, um, Hurricane Katrina, when we went to um, Biloxi, Mississippi, um, there was a, I'm trying to think of, Red Cross. There was a Red Cross tent and an Encore tent right there together. And they told us that the Encore was there first, and then the Red Cross came in, and then when it was time to go, a couple years later, um, Red Cross left first, and Encore was still there. So it's really, really, really a good organization. We should be proud of them. Now on to the Lighthouse. The Lighthouse is a recovery mission that our church sponsors. It is here local in Fort Wayne, and we need to be very proud of sponsoring them. They help um, men that are addicted to um, drugs or alcohol, and it's a religious program, and it's, it's just so cool. They just have a lot of Bible studies, and so instead of filling their um, tummies with um, alcohol or drugs, they're filling their hearts with Jesus. And they have classes all day long. There are counselors there to help them. And it's just a really good organization. And not only do they help the men, there's a 30-day program, a six-month program, and a two-year program. And so the men graduate through each of these programs. And they're just, they're just sweethearts, the, the guys that they help. And they're just appreciative. And they can walk in and out, so they get them and they don't stay, but the ones that do stay, their lives are truly changed. And it's just a really, really good organization. And Brandon and some of the guys were here a couple weeks ago. That's them, that's part of Lighthouse. And something else that's really cool about Lighthouse is that they're trying to help the community around them. And they have the food um, bank that is open um, for the community, and so a family can go and get food, and they don't ask anything in return. The only thing they ask is at the lighthouse on State Street, they ask that they would attend a class. So there's um, Bible classes, there's just um, a fellowship kind of class on a Thursday afternoon, just get to know your neighbors, and then on Friday nights they have a worship service at 7 o'clock. And Jeff and I, I don't know, we go two out four weeks to that worship service. And so just, um, we would invite you to come and go with us. It's really, really fun. And you get to know the guys, and um, you'll just see how sweet they are. But, um, so come and go to that with us sometime. And, oh, the most important thing. I shouldn't say the most important thing, should I, on Sunday morning? <laughs> okay, we need a half-court shooter. And the really sad thing about this that we have that we have learned is that that's when Leo's spring break is. The, the shooting contest is going to be on the 31st, which is a Thursday, and that's Leo's spring break. 
So we need some of you people to step up and shoot that basketball. I got it. Got it covered. You got it. You know I got games. One well, reason you fell in love with me, right? I got games, right? <laughs> Under guys. Shaking his head no. <laughs> <laughs> so today, after worship, as we're going to get our coffee, get your coffee and cookie and come into the gym. We need guys to shoot. We need girls to shoot. Also, last year a 60-year-old lady shot. Okay? So this is how she did it. This is the secret. For every one hundred dollars, the church donates, they get to move up one foot. Oh, wow. Ooh. Okay? Wow. We got so, this. So we need your help. Okay, we need your help. And we have two little buckets. I have no idea what happened to them between here and home. They're still in the car. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we have two little buckets. I'll go get them. Um, and so if you would just put a donation in those, please. There's a black and gold one kind of for that Purdue school. And <laughs> go Purdue, I mean, why? Hi, you didn't make it. It was sad. <laughs> Jeff cried. <laughs> so anyway, so if you would just please make a donation, because whoever shoots for us on the 31st for every hundred dollars, they get to go up a foot. And this lady made, last year she made so much money. Are you ready for this? They got a step ladder. Because, <laughs> because she had more money left over after she was under the basket. They got a step ladder. And she got to go up. She got to climb steps <laughs> to get her close, closer. So. That, that's a very cool story, but it's much more fun when we talk about how she dumped it. You know? <laughs> I think the part about the ladder out. You can change your imagination. <laughs> okay, so this is what, this is our bragging rights. Mm -hmm. This is what we get. We get to put our name on this trophy. Look at that trophy. Now, wouldn't it be an honorable thing for us to put our name on that trophy? And see, her name is that little plaque down there. We could put Leo United Methodist Church and the person that did it right under that. So, that's what, um, and all of this goes totally, our donations go totally to the Lighthouse and their ministry. So, please consider that and I'll go get the bucket. All right. Thank you, Rhonda. Hey, good morning, Leo. Good morning. It's so good to see you. So good to have you here. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, Rustin. And thank you, musicians, also. Hey, just wanted to piggyback really quickly on um, Encore. I mean, as if we, we are right to be proud of the fact that we are a global church, we're a connectional church, and that that UMCOR is usually, more often than not, the first in, the last out on disasters like Katrina. And as Rhonda said, we, we saw that live and in person. And also just want to reiterate this, because this is so important, that, that the, all the overhead costs to UMCOR are taken care of up front. I mean, your, your ties and your offerings every week, they go to the conference office and then on to the, the more global church. And, and all the salaries that, and all the administrative costs that go with home care, they're already prepaid. So if something like Ukraine, for example, comes up and, and there's a special need and you're asked to donate money for that special need, like Ukraine or Katrina or some natural disaster, every dollar you send for that special initiative, that special offering, 100% of it goes to Encore. So that's why I'm so proud of that organization. So one of the reasons I'm proud to be a Methodist is because we've got things like that going on. And it's one of the reasons I'm so proud of you guys, because you're so generous. And I want to just as your pastor, from your pastor's heart to you, thank you for your generosity and, and just the fact that you care, because that's what that generosity represents. So you heard Russian talk about all the meetings that we have this week. One of them for me today is our uh, pre-conference meeting. Our annual conference happens in May and June, in June I think. And so we're, we've got this little housekeeping uh, meeting to um, get ready for that. That's a Zoom meeting for, for our meeting this evening. But um, I want to just tell you a little bit about that because this is the way the church works is we elect delegates to go to annual conference to represent you. So some of those delegates that we, represent, that we elect are called equalization members. And that's just a fancy way of saying that we need so many lay people to offset the number of clergy so that it's everybody in the church is represented. And that's what it's all about. That's what the meeting is. Now, I don't, don't really want to bore you with that housekeeping detail other than to say this. 
For some of you that are really zeroed in on what's happening with the Methodist Church right now, you, some of the big news worldwide Methodist Church has been that our general conference has been postponed yet again. So it's going to be postponed from this summer to the summer of 2024. And just so you know, um, it, it's caused some consternation in Methodist Nation, right? Uh, some people are disappointed with the delay. Some people see the wisdom of the delay. And um, either way, it's just, it's just caused some, some strife and some drama that I wish we didn't have. So I say that simply to say this. Please pray for our church. And I don't mean just Leo United Methodist Church. Please pray for our denomination that we would continue to serve in the way that God would call us to serve, that we would serve faithfully, and that we would go where God leads us no matter where that is. So I would covet your prayers on that. So having said all of that, are you ready to go deeper into worship? I hope so. I hope you're saying yes, because that's exactly what we're going to do. So I'd like to invite Connie to come up now and get your get your lungs ready, stretch, you know, stand up and stretch, get those muscles ready, stretch those bodies, and let's sing with joy to the Lord.
So last week we started the sermon series on prayer, more specifically the Lord's Prayer. And um, many of you are seasoned saints and you know the Lord's Prayer. You, you know it by heart. You could say it in the middle of the night, awake from a deep sleep. You could say it because you know it so well. You also know, in the life of this particular church, we've gotten away from the Lord's Prayer a bit. And we're kind of coming back to it. But before we do that, we're unpacking it and, and taking a really more intense and much closer look at it and what it means. Last week you heard Matthew's version of the prayer, and this week you're going to hear Luke's version of how Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and we're going to unpack more of that in just a moment, but over the next several weeks we're going to be talking, not quite line by line, but almost, an element by element, stanza by stanza of the prayer, what it means to our Christian faith, and why it's important that we really understand fully what it means. Now here's, here's the really cool thing, at least I think it's cool. That when Palm Sunday comes, we'll say the Lord's Prayer together in corporate worship. And this time when we say it, we, and, and I don't remember the last time, I mean, I don't know the last time that you said it here in corporate worship at Leo United Methodist Church. But we'll say it together in corporate worship for the very first time on Palm Sunday. And my prayer is that when we say it, we'll have a deeper and fuller understanding of what we mean when we say it and what we're asking God to do. And asking to walk alongside him as he continues to co-create the world and all that's in it. All right? So that's my objective and what I hope will happen. But to get ready to go deeper into worship now, let's prepare our hearts to pray. Are you ready? Let's pray. Morning, Lord. It was in the silence that the prophet Elijah heard your voice. He heard your gentle whisper. And he heard that whisper in the midst of tumult and turmoil of all that was going on around Elijah. Noise of thunder and clutter and chaos and fear and trepidation. But when God said, breathe deep, step back, listen, Elijah heard your voice in the silence. We relished that silence and we waited for your voice. Lead us and guide us in this worship service today. May the message be your words rather than this pastor's. May they find their way into your hearts and our hearts so that if you can work your will through us as we work with you to build your kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, both the one that is to come and the one that we're building right here on this earth right now. Bless us and keep us in these and all things. And all of God's people said, Amen. So last week, we started this series about uh, the Lord's Prayer with the first line of the Lord's Prayer, which kind of makes sense, right? Our Father, who is in heaven. So right away we identify a couple of things about God. We identify that, that God is righteous and holy, and, we, and for, for our part, as people who kind of understand what the story is all about, we stipulate to that. We, we agree, and I think Jesus is teaching his disciples that we stipulate to the fact that God is all-powerful, he's righteous, holy, he's all of that that we've been taught, that's who and what God is. Yep, amen, exclamation mark. But, but with, with the way the, the prayer starts, Jesus is teaching 
something new to the disciples about God. Something new about God, that, that God sees himself as a parent, right? Now, the thing about that is that they wouldn't have been uh, unversed with that. They would have understood that God sees himself as a parent. That in that book, male, mom, and dad, there are aspects of God's personality. They would have known that from the Psalms and previous teaching. But here's what was new. How Jesus packaged it was new. Basically, he says that in teaching the prayer and opening it this way, he's saying that, yes, God is all-powerful, almighty, omnipotent, omnipotent, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful. God is all of those things. And yes, God does see himself as a parent. But what's new is he sees himself as a parent first. Before anything else is true about God, and all that, all that stuff is true, but before anything else is true about God, God as Father, God as Daddy, God as the loving, generous parent, that is the most important thing. And when God looks at himself in the mirror, what, he's, what he sees looking back at him is a parent. And that would have been a new concept for the disciples. So this week, we were looking at the second part of the prayer, the part of the prayer that you're going to hear in just a moment. But that part of the prayer uh, talks about something equally important uh, and no less important. And as I said earlier, today we're going to be hearing Luke's version of Jesus' response to the disciples' request, Lord, teach us to pray. Are you ready to hear what Luke has to say about it? Well, let's listen. This is the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. Jesus teaching about prayer. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying. As he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said, This is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Rustin. So that is the, I think that's the NIV version of the prayer, what Luke has to say. Those of you that remember the more traditional line, you know that our Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and then the King James version is, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So those are pretty powerful words. And I don't think they would have been lost on the disciples. And when we really think about it, when we really do dive into those words, <clears throat> we understand there's some key things at play. Three, three key things, in fact, that we're going to look at more closely today. The first one is that God is in charge. That's what that statement says. God, you might be the divine daddy, but you're in charge, right? Second thing is that God has a plan. God has a plan for created humanity and all the created world in it. And he has that plan. He's going to stick to it. And that it, it is all encompassing. And it is the everything. Right? The third thing that we're going to be looking at today as we try to understand this second sentence is that God does have a plan, but he invites us into it with him. That there is a purpose for us in the plan of God. So those three things. God's in charge. God has a plan. And we have a role in that plan. Those three things. So, God's in charge. Well, of course, right? I mean, that's been part of our, our faith journey from the very beginning. And as Jesus lays the groundwork for this God as divine father, divine daddy, one of the things we know about parenthood, at least in my experience with parenthood, is that if you're going to be a really good parent, sometimes you have to do things that your kids aren't going to like, 
And then you have to kind of be in charge. You have to kind of set up boundaries. And you don't do that for your convenience if you're a good parent, right? You set up boundaries for your children because it's in their best interest. Amen? So God's a God of boundaries. He sets boundaries for us. Now, to, to examine this more closely, let me ask you a question. Right? It's a hypothetical question or a rhetorical question, so you think about the answer in your head, but do think about it, right? So here is the question. Do, do you believe in a literal Garden of Eden as described in the book of Genesis? Do you believe that's the literal thing that happened, that there was a Garden of Eden that, that, that is there and that's part of God's created story? Now, whether you believe that the Bible is the, the literal Word of God or the inspired Word of God, that's a, that's a topic for another day. Uh, the more deeper question for our purposes today is, did God create the world, everything in it, and lay it all out, and then something happened? That's what I'm asking you to really consider. Right? So another way to get at that is to ask this question. Do you think that the world we live in right now, this world with war and, and racism and pestilence and famine and earthquakes and hurricanes and all of the wicked stuff that happens in this world, do you think this is the world that God created for us? It's an interesting question, isn't it? I, I wish as a pastor that I had a dollar for every time somebody would ask me a question, God, why, why did God create this world like this? Why, why did God let this happen? Why does God permit, you know, fill in the blank, right? And you wrestled with those questions too, haven't you, right? Well, what I've learned over the years is that in response to that question, well, who says God did that? So when you look at, at the, this creation story from Genesis, no matter how you see it, whether it's a metaphor, whether it's the literal truth, the, the key core fact remains that the world that we're living in, at least in my humble opinion, this is not the original world God intended that us to live in. The, intent, the, the, the world that God intended us to live in was a world of perfection, just like God is perfection. But see, God allowed his human beings to do one key thing. He allowed us to choose. That's pretty important, isn't it? It's important because in allowing us to choose, we chose to love and accept God as he is and to live with God on his terms or not. And humans chose not. We, we decided we wanted to live our life on our terms, have it our way. And, and that's a problem for God, this righteous and holy, just God and this loving parent, I, I imagine that it was painful. That was a painful moment for God when we choose as humans that, hey, we love you, but we're going we're gonna to do it our way, you know, like we're some kind of rebellious teenager. You remember the story, right? The story is that, that Eve ate of the forbidden food fruit, got Adam to join in with them, and, 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 it, and basically we rejected God by wanting to have it our own way, and then God allowed us to live out the consequences of that decision, and he, he had to kick us out of the garden because he's a loving parent, right? And loving parents, when they establish boundaries, they also, they mean it when those boundaries have consequences. We violated those, those boundaries, and so we have consequences, and we got kicked out of the garden. Not because God was mad at us, and not just because God's feelings were hurt, I think they were. But we chose, and God allowed us to live out the consequences of our choice. And that's why we're living in the world that we're living in. Right? I think it's important, though, that when we wrestle with that beginning point in our faith journey, that we also fully understand that that's only the very beginning. And that's only the very first part of the story. And as we fast forward through the rest of our faith journey from that point to this one, we see that God is vigorously at work in trying to get us back into the garden. It's really all about. It. In the book of Matthew alone, the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven some 70 plus times. I remember right, something like that. So he uses the image of the kingdom of heaven repeatedly. Maybe another way to think about that is that that's Jesus' way of saying God is working really hard to get us back to the garden. So God's in charge. 
violate the boundaries, there are consequences to that. So this world that we're living in right now is not the one that God originally wanted us to live. It's still God's. God still owns it. God still allows us to live in it, but it's not the one that God originally intended us to live in. That's coming. That's part of God's plan. God's plan is to return us to the garden, to restore us, to redeem us, to, to have us get to the place where when the next time we're offered the choice between the garden and not the garden, that our choice will be a fully informed and fully vivacious, yes, we choose to stay with you. That's the journey. That's what we're trying to get to. That's, that's how God is trying to get us from this point to that point. And the plan is great. Now, what is the plan, right? Well, we could talk about that for weeks on end, I suppose. Here's a, a really simple way to think of it. When we live in this world that isn't the original one that God intended for us, we're living horizontally. We're living kind of like this, that we're looking at the world around us and everything in it as if this is all there is, right? That's what's living horizontally. Here's a great way to illustrate the point. So before I do, God calls us to live vertically, where we're kind of thinking that, you know, this isn't all there is. There's more to it than this. So we're living in this horizontal world with a vertical perspective. Now, here's a great way to illustrate that difference. It seems there was this missionary, and he was in this African village, and, and, and there was a, a, a landowner of great wealth and, and vast wealth. And they have a really pronounced culture of hospitality in Africa. And in this particular African village, this, this person as a leader of this village was playing host to this missionary. And he's a very gracious, polite host. And so he was asking the missionary about himself, and the missionary then, as wanting to be equally polite, said, well, ask the man about himself. And he says, ah, well, uh, I would invite you to look to the west. And the missionary does that. And the, the landowner says, what do you see? And the missionary says, wow, I, I see a vast grazing land and, and, and cattle too numerous to count. And the villager says, just so, well, that, that's all mine. I own all of that. The missionary, very, very impressive. Thinking that now we're going to go on to the next part of our conversation. And, and then the landowner says, now I'd invite you to, to look to the north. What do you see? So, well, I, I see a, a beautiful lake and, and all these animals teeming around it. And, and I see villagers coming to the lake to get their water. And I see the, 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 the livestock coming to the kids so they have water. And, and the, the landowner says, ah, just so I own that lake. And I allow the villagers to use it, and it supplies my animals, because I own the lake. The missionary. Very impressive. Very impressive. Again, thinking to get on with the next phase of the conversation, but the landowner says, now I'd like to invite you to look to the south. That's what he does, right? And what do you see? Well, I see vast barns, I mean, dozens of barns. And the, the, the landowner says, just so. And all of them are filled with grain. My grain, my only grain. Wow, pretty impressive. And I finally look to the, look to the east. What do you see? I see a, a, a big river with a huge bridge across it. It's a pretty impressive structure. What a, what a feat of architecture. And beaming, the landowner says, oh, I had that bridge built, it, it's, it's mine. I had it built, and I let the people use it for a modest fee because of, to help pay for the cost of it, I, I, it's, I could get a lot more, but I, choose to, I chose to charge this modest fee because I'm a generous man, but I own the bridge, and the bridge is so well built that even when the river floods, the bridge will withstand it. I own all of that. The missionary nods. You are a man of means, and it appears that you're a man of generosity. You share all of that bounty, but we've talked a lot about all you own this way. What do you own this way? Now, the Africans that heard that proffer would have immediately understood what the missionary was asking. You're living your life in this vertical way, and you're bringing joy to people, sure, and you're getting vastly rich, and there's nothing wrong with that, but in your mind, is this all there is, or is there a purpose to this beyond the end of this world? Does God have a plan? Yes. I think his plan is for us to consider what it is to live both horizontally, because we have to, this is where we live, right? 
but also, will you consider living vertically? Will you consider living as if, as, as great as this can be, and as tragic as it can be, would you consider living in a way that reflects the, the, the reality for us as people of faith that this is not all there is? Would you consider that? I think that's God's plan for us. That's, he's inviting us into that consideration. I think that's what the, the phrase means. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Would you consider, as you contemplate what it is to live on earth, will you consider what it's like to have the kingdom of heaven right here at your fingertips, and not just in some distant place or some far-off future, but right here and right now? Right? Which brings us to the part of God's plan where we are invited to be a part of it. But before we do that, there's something to kind of illustrate that point that I want to share with you. Um, we sung this song before in worship here in a Methodist publication called The Faith We Sing. A guy named Marty Houser wrote this great song called Gather Us In. And there's a line in the song that illustrates this point about what it is to be a part of God's plan and to join in where God is talking. And he frames it this way. He talks about what heaven is, and he says it this way. Not in the dark of some building confining, and not in some heaven light years away, but here in this place, a new light is shining. Now is the time. This is the place. I love that song. It's one of my favorites. And like I said, we've sung it here before. You'll probably hear it again someday. But what I really like about that song, more than anything else, is it illustrates this reality of, yes, the kingdom of heaven is to come, but it's also now. It's also right now, right here in this place and in the world beyond us. Even though this is a, the theological phrase is a fallen world, not the one that God originally designed for us, that we are co-creators with God in this moment. Now going back to the story of Genesis, we know what God did on the first six days, right? What did he do on the seventh day? Say it with me. He rested. I don't think it said he quit, right? He rested. What that implies to me is that he got up Monday morning, rolled up his sleeves, and went right back to work, just like we do. Amen? And God is still at work. And God is inviting us on a daily basis to join with him in that work. Now, what does that look like when we join God in his work? Well, first of all, it's a mindset kind of thing, isn't it? When we consider what it is to live horizontally and vertically, it is a, it is a part of our worldview. We realize that, that this is not all there is, that there is something better, there's something beyond, right? Now, very briefly, let's contrast that with the worldview of people that don't have that perspective, that live only horizontally. One of the great examples of that for me is Ernest Hemingway. One of my favorite authors, I love reading Hemingway. But when you know a little bit about the man, he was a pronounced atheist. And he vigorously defended his atheism. He lived a very hedonistic lifestyle, right? And his worldview was, hey, there's no God, there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's nothing. Once, once you die, you're just, you're just worm food. That's it, right? That's, that's, that was his worldview. So consider that for a moment. Try to put yourself into the framework of his worldview. <clears throat> and when Hemingway got to the point or he could no longer enjoy the pleasures of life, he took his nickel-plated shotgun and blew his brains out. Now that's tragic. But given his worldview, it's, it's logical, right? Part of the plan of God is inviting us into a consideration of not just what it is to live this horizontal life where we can see, taste, touch, fit, smell, and feel, but this vertical life of, of a reality and faith that is yet unseen. Did you hear that? A reality and faith that is as yet unseen. Now, imagine that if you were solidly in that worldview, and you were solidly bought in and sold and convicted on what it is to live this vertical lifestyle in a horizontal world, how would the world look different to you? Well, you wouldn't do what Hemingway did, right? Again, you know, I mean, I, Hemingway was operating within his version of reality, what he perceived reality to be. That is not our reality, friends, amen? And, and for us to take the route that Hemingway took was, would be an act of theft. 
from our perspective. Amen? So living in this vertical world, the, the world changes dramatically for the better. Because we're living as if we've got places to go beyond this one. And we're going to try to make this place we're in right now as closely resemble to what that ultimate reality will be as we can before we have to part company with it. That's our duty, that's our job, that's our chore. That is us engaging in the plan of God and putting that redemptive plan into work. And we see examples of this all over. We see people who are extraordinarily, heroically generous. And many years in the world probably wouldn't be. They might out of some compassion, but to be heroically generous, probably not. Right? To be outrageously forgiving, I mean, uh, otherworldly forgiving. Last night, several of us went to a, a, a preview of a movie called A Pull from Darkness, and the power of this movie was that this woman had been trafficked into the sex slave trade, and, and she had been woefully abused for years. And, and as you can imagine, her health was wrecked, her spirit was wrecked, everything about her was wrecked, except her determination to be reunited with her children. And one of the most powerful scenes in the movie is she's, she's found Jesus. She wasn't, didn't know Jesus before, but she found Jesus and she discovered who that was and what that meant. And she was all in. And finally, in one of the last scenes of the movie, as she's dying of cancer, she says, I forgive them. And the nurse who's been her, become her friend and is administering aid to her, bends closer and says, what? Excuse me? I forgive them. Who? The men. The men who did this to me. I forgive them. And I pray for them. But in fact, I like to think I'm all in. I'm not sure I could do that. Kill them? Yeah, I could do that. Shoot each and every one of them? Oh, yeah. I could, I could picture myself doing that. Forgiving them? Your pastor has a little work to do. Maybe you do too. But that's not the point. The point is that we've been invited into this process of living vertically as instead of horizontally and, and making this earth as close to heaven as we can make it before we go to actual heaven. We'd be more generous. We'd be more forgiving. We'd be, we'd be more kind, more patient. We would be more courageous. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if you were totally sold out to this reality that we, have, we believe in as Jesus followers, this reality of things yet to be seen? If we were totally convicted about it and totally embraced in it, can you imagine how much more courageous we would be? We see glimpses of that, don't we, when people are just outrageously courageous. I'm sure there are examples of that happening in the Ukraine right now as we speak, this courage of putting something bigger and greater ahead of yourself, right? And we see examples of it all the time. In a moment, I'm going to show you a film clip from a movie called North Country. It came out in 2005, and, and Charlize Theron plays a single mom, and uh, she's trying to, to raise her two kids, and it, she's struggling. The kinds of jobs that she can get are basically minimum wage jobs, or, and, and just she can't make enough to get by. Well, she has an opportunity to get hired into the, the local mine, the local iron ore mine, and um, this is in the late 80s, so the mines at that point had just been recently opened up to women working there. Right? Very different time than now. This is a time when you know, there, there was men's work and there was women's work, and mining was definitely men's work, and she goes into that, that male world. Now the men are loving and open and honorable and say, oh, welcome aboard, sister, we're glad to have you. Not. <laughs> And it was a very hostile work environment, and she put up with a lot. And finally, she quits. But she decides that she's not going to let the fight end there. So she decides that she's going to sue the mine because justice is an issue. Right? And this scene that you're about to see is her trying to hire a lawyer played by Woody Harrelson to take her case. This lawyer was also a former hockey star, so he's. He's got some cachet, he's got some credibility in this community, and this is, this is an example of what it would be like to be an unimaginably courageous. Let's have a look.
Good luck with that. I'm saying I want to hire you. Sorry. Don't do that anymore. Well, that sucks because you were the only lawyer I ever met. Well, the good news is, all roads lead to lawyers. <laughs> Tell you what, I will buy a beer. I don't need a beer. I need a lawyer. Look, Josie, the illusion is that all your problems are solved. But the reality is that even when you win, yeah, I'm sure you are, but right has nothing to do with the real world. Look at Anita Hill. So she's you. You think it's all done with the mind. Wait till you get to a courtroom. You call the nuts defense. You're either nuts and you imagine it or you're, and you ask for it. Either way, it's not pleasant. Take my advice. Find another job. Start over. I don't have any starter left. Look, you're a beautiful girl. You could always. You're a beautiful girl. I could find a guy to take care of me. I'm not going to be taken care of. I want to take care of myself, take care of my kids. You know what's happening to all of us? Every woman up there. You don't give it, do you? So I look at that, that clip, I'm reminded of a, the fact that this is a movie, it's an entertaining story, and it may be a reflection of reality too, and all that's well and good, but there's also a predicate for it in the Old Testament. There's a great story about a woman named Esther. And this is historical truth, right? As well as a biblical story. And Esther became a queen because a Gentile king took a fancy to her, right? And there was a rule in the kingdom that, that nobody could approach the king without being invited. And if they did, the penalty was death unless the king extended, extended his scepter and basically said, okay, come on in. Because if he didn't do that, you know, it's kind of a brutal plan to not waste the king's time, amen? Right. He also had an advisor in his court that was an anti-Semite, and, and he wanted to wipe out all the Jews, so he kind of manipulated the policy decree of the kingdom so that that was about to happen. But, see, Haman didn't know this advisor. The king didn't know that Esther was Jewish and didn't know that she was connected to this thorn and the evil guy's side. His name was Mordecai, Esther's cousin. And Mordecai came to Esther and said, hey, listen, we got this big problem here. Our people are about to get wiped out. And Esther said, oh, well, I'd love to help you. But there's a hard and fast rule. If I go to the king and uninvited and he does not, I'm, and I'm not sure that's what I want to do. Reasonable response, and that's a vertical, a horizontal, a vertical, horizontal response. Right? It may have been a response that Hemingway would have taken, not because Hemingway wasn't courageous or didn't have the capacity to be courageous, but Hemingway may not have taken that because he not, wouldn't have seen enough upside to it, right? But Uncle Mordecai says to Esther, you got to do this because you're in a position to do it. But understand this, if you don't do it, God will raise up a, a savior from another place, and it won't be you, and you'll miss out on the blessing of being that guy. And that won't go well for you. And who knows? Most famous line, one of the most famous lines of the Bible, right? Who knows? But that for a time such as this, you've been raised up for this purpose. I maintain that that story is an example of how God invites us into some nasty places so that this world can be a more vertical one and a less horizontal one. Now, maybe that hasn't happened for you. Maybe you've not 
then invited to save all the Jews with your one act of selfless sacrifice. Maybe, maybe you've not been invited to put it all on the line and take 300 of your buddies and go fight an army of 30,000 the way Gideon was. Maybe you've not been called to the cross of Calvary. But I do imagine that there are times when you've been in uncomfortable situations where something really wrong was going on. You had a choice to speak up or stay silent. I think God is inviting us to not be silent because our silence is condoning, amen? And for all of us, to one degree or another, there is a moment of, for a time, such as this. So may you be courageous. May you be generous. May you be faithful. May you be fruitful, even when it costs you something, especially when it costs you something. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And all of God's people said, Amen. So I'd like to invite Connie to come back up and let's uh, sing one more time, all right? So, stand up and stretch, and get those voices ready, stretch out those lungs, and let's go. Thank you. 